worried when I saw my daughter getting up to introduce me and I was wondering whether I would have had to question paternity. Uh, but our mom is safe. It's, it's a pleasure being here today. I'm afraid to look at the time. But the atmosphere at church is absolutely amazing today. It's cold, not the kind of uh, weather for a man out of the Caribbean, but the atmosphere in here is absolutely great. The music was wonderful, and I thoroughly enjoyed the service so far today. Let me just say a pleasant Sabbath to all of you. Those who are online, you are missing out on a great on a, you missed out on a great service today. You should be here. There is no excuse. So we have got masks available if you're worried about that. But come on and let us fellowship together. My topic for today is the deadly delusion. Uh, it is my hope that the message will not will be long enough today to cover the relevant parts of the topic, but short enough for you to want more. The text for consideration is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 13, reading from verse, verse 11 to verse 18. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused it the earth, and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound, wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword, and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Shall we pray? Father, fill me with your spirit today. As you attempt to use this clay vessel to speak to your people and to bring a, your message to them. Bless your church today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hollywood is obsessed with the mark of the beast. Lots of movies have been made concerning, regarding the mark of the beast. If you can recall the movie, The Omen, the trilogy, with Damien, the actor, in that movie. 
one of the worst movies I've ever seen is a Nollywood movie called The Mark of the Beast. Horrible movie it was. Identifying the mark of the beast is a very difficult issue. What does the mark of the beast symbolize? What is it about the mark of the beast that is so captivating to us? And how can we discover its meaning? Whenever we think about the Bible, we always need to go back to the time in which the book of the Bible was written. Because if the people at the time did not understand the book, now, I, I should say it this way, that the peop, when the book was written, it was written so that the people to whom it was written to originally would understand what it's about. So every book should have an original context. We cannot have a book written only for some people in the distant future and not for the people in the time in which it was written. So the book of Revelation, when that book was written, the people probably had an understanding of the meaning of the mark of the beast. John wrote Revelation at around... AD 90, somewhere between AD 90 and 100, somewhere in the last decade of the first century. And during that time, Christians were suffering under severe persecution by imperial Rome. They had been subjected to what we call certificates of conformity that demanded emperor worship. In fact, the emperor Domitian, who ruled during the last two decades of the first century, that is from AD 81 to 96 AD, during the same period when Revelation was written, insisted on being called Dominus et Deus, meaning Lord, and God. We call Thomas in the book of John, chapter 20, after Jesus had resurrected and his colleagues told him that Jesus was resurrected and was seen by them. He did not believe. And he asked that G he stick his finger in the palm prints of Jesus to verify that it was Jesus indeed. And when Thomas did that, he said, to Jesus, my Lord and my God, Dominus wanted to be worshipped as God. He called himself Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. Christians living around this time would have applied the mark of the beast to emperor worship and they had good reasons for doing so. Throughout history, the mark of the beast was understood to mean different things at different times. However, Revelation chapter 13 indicates clearly that the ultimate application of the mark of the beast is set for the time of the end, just prior to the second coming of Christ. It is in the final conflict that the mark of the beast will become a sign of allegiance for those who worship the satanic trinity in contrast to those who worship God and obey him by keeping his commandments. The mark of the beast in Revelation stands in, form, in sharp contrast to the seal of God. The basic function of both the seal and the mark of the beast 
is ownership, identity, and protection. Both are signs of loyalty to God or loyalty to the beast. In the final crisis, the commandments of God will emerge as that standard of loyalty and obedience. Notice that at the end of time, saints having the divine seal are described as those who keep the commandments of God. Therefore, it appears to me that the mark of the beast is a substitution of obedience to the beast instead of obedience to God. The first four commandments of the Decalogue, thou shalt have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that it is in the earth beneath. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. These four commandments will become the test of loyalty to God in the final conflict. These first four commandments are concerned about one's relationship with God and about proper worship. The groups at the end of time are identified as those who worship God versus those who worship the dragon and the beast. Throughout Revelation, we see activities of the sea beast as it attacks the first four commandments. Revelation verse 13 and verse 4. Revelation 13, sorry, and verse 4. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, say, who is like unto the beast? This is a direct attack on the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Think again, Revelation chapter 13, verse 14 and 15, that they shall make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he gave power, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast, should be killed. This is a direct violation of the second commandment. You shall not make unto you any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above or in the earth beneath. Again, Revelation chapter 5, chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. This blasphemy is a violation of your third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The demand that one should receive, and that was a demand that one should receive the mark of the beast, is a direct attack on the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, because it is a Sabbath commandment that identifies who is the creator and who should be worshipped. So the demand to have the mark of the beast is an attack upon the Sabbath commandment. So you see, the activities of the beast in Revelation chapter 14 should be viewed as an attack on the first four commandments of the Decalogue. In the last days, it is these four commandments that will be at the forefront of the battle. Just want to pause a moment to talk about something about the Sabbath. In the Old Testament, the seventh-day Sabbath was unequivocally defined 
as the distinctive sign that distinguishes, that distinguished the people of Israel from other people. The Sabbath was an external sign of belonging to the true God. And it shows a special relationship between God and his covenant people. The Sabbath was a constant reminder to Israel that God was their creator and their savior. These aspects of the Sabbath is emphasized in Revelation chapter, chapters 12 to 14. Although the issue of the Sabbath, of the final crisis, is not confined to just the Sabbath, the Sabbath will ev evidently become the litmus test of loyalty and obedience in the final crisis. In Revelation 14, John describes God's final appeal to the inhabitants of the earth. He does so in terms of calling them to worship the true God, the creator. And this was done in the context of the fourth commandment. The appeal to worship the creator God is followed by a proclamation of the other two angels who announced the fall of Babylon and warned against the worshiping of the beast and receiving of the mark in the right hand and in the forehead. This call to the people to worship the true God is in relation to the Sabbath commandment and the warning not to receive the beast, not to worship the beast or to receive his mark suggests strongly that the mark of the beast functions as a counterfeit to the Sabbath commandment. That, that receiving of the mark has something to do with the commandment of God is further confirmed when we look into verse 12 of the chapter where the worshipers of God are characterized as those who keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. The text seems to indicate that as the Sabbath will be the distinctive sign of obedience to God in keeping his commandments in the final crisis, so the mark of the beast, the counterfeit Sabbath, will become the sign of obedience to the beast. The receiving of the mark of the beast will stand in direct opposition to God's commandments. One theologian by the name of William J. Johnson states that, while the non-observance of the Sabbath or Sunday observance is not the mark per se just now, both are integral to its end time enforcement. The Sabbath, he continues, anciently the sign of the people of God will again come to the fore to show the world those who put God first. So we see, church, that any identification of the mark of the beast must in some way be in contrast to the ideals and purposes of the Sabbath. Let's now go back to Revelation chapter 13, and this time verse 16. And he calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in the right hand or in the foreheads. Here in this text, we see the image of the beast makes a demand of all earth dwellers to receive a mark on the right hand or in the foreheads. The mandate extends to all people, everyone, all civil ranks, small or great, all economic strata, rich or poor, all social categories, free and slaves. Nobody is exempted. Everyone is covered. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3, the saints standing on the threshold of the great tribulation are sealed on their foreheads. The name of God was written in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. And I look and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, 
having his father's name written in the foreheads. The seal of God consists of the name of God written on the foreheads of the saints. This set them apart as God's people and protect them from the defeat of the enemy and for the judgment and from the judgment of God. But just as God as a mark has marked his faithful people with a seal, so Satan marks the followers and worshippers of the beast on the right hand or in the forehead with the name of the beast. And that no man might buy or sell, that he save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So, as God marks his people with the name of the Lamb, so the beast marks his people with his name. And these marks are in contrast to each other. Now consider the forehead. The forehead where the mark is located stands for the mind. And the right hand stands for deeds and actions. Beatrice Neal states, the reception of the mark of the beast and the seal of God consists of the names of the beast and the seal of God denotes conformity to the character to the character of either Satan or of God. Since sealing signifies the working presence of the Holy Spirit in the human heart, the placing of the mark of the beast counterfeits the work of the Holy Spirit. The people with the mark of the beast are brought into a false religious system and they serve that system with their hearts and with their minds. Some of them willingly, some of them reluctantly, but all of them serve that false religious system. So the marks of the beast clearly functions clearly as the counterfeit of the seal of God. Sealing is a symbol of a genuine Christian. The sealed person belongs to God as his own possession. The worshippers of the beast bears the symbolic mark of ownership and loyalty to Satan. You see, church, the mark on the hand or the forehead signifies the writing of God's law in the minds and behavior of his people. In the Old Testament, this was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Thou shalt not love the Lord thy God, thou shalt, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. It was written in their hearts too. For Jesus, these words, remember Jesus when he was talking about the commandments. He said these, those words was a summary of the first four commandments. This suggests to me that the demand of the beast to have the mark on the right hand or the forehead stands as an antithesis to God's commandments. The exchange of obedience to the beast for obedience to God. One theologian that I follow very well, his name is John Pauline, he states that the testing truth for the world in the final crisis is centered on proper worship. There will be only two categories of people living at the end of time. The worshipers of the true God having their seal on their foreheads and the worshippers of, sat of the satanic trinity having the mark of the beast on their hands or on their foreheads. It is the seal of God or the mark of the beast that will distinguish these two groups of worshippers in the final crisis. Nobody, no one will sit on the fence. You either receive the seal of God or... You've got the mark of the beast. There is no middle ground. Those who have the mark of the beast 
contrast with those who keep the commandments of God. So the mark of the beast has to do with the violation of the commandment of God. When the seal of God, while the seal of God has to do with keeping of those commandments, and it is not just any of the commandments, but specifically, as I mentioned before, the first four commandments, because these commandments have to do with our relationship to God. There will be many who will honor their parents. They will not steal. They will not kill. They will not commit adultery. They will not covet. They will not lie. But they still will not honor and worship the true God. It is the first four commandments that will be at the center of the final crisis. The strategy of the sea beast of Revelation is an organized attack on those four commandments, one of which is keeping the seventh day Sabbath. In order to secure compliance, with the demand to receive the mark of the beast on the right hand or in the forehead, the measure is taken that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, the phrase to buy or sell can be understood both literally or figuratively. I should say, and figuratively. There will be economic sanctions against those who will not submit to the demands of the powers at B. That's why I always urge that we as Seventh-day Adventists must create our own economic and financial structures. Becoming financially independent will help alleviate some of the concerns with regards to our employment or our ability to exist. However, these measures are not what will protect us in the last days. It is Michael who will stand up for his people who are faithful to their God and have kept the commandments faithfully. On the other hand, the highly figurative context of Revelation 13 suggests a figurative meaning to buying and selling. We're not going into many much details about this, but let me say that one must view the buying and selling as a symbolic way of expressing the social isolation and hardship that the faithful and sealed followers of Christ will endure at the time when the whole world is buying and selling Babylon's false spiritual merchandise. In a time when everyone else is selling and buying the corrupt doctrines and policies of Babylon. Those who worship the beast buys Babylon's merchandise and serves her purpose to destroy those who remain faithful to Christ until the point of death. There will be hardship, no doubt, but being overcomers is also will not be in any doubt. Revelation 13 and verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. The wisdom referred here is not brilliant and intellectual ability to calculate the number of the beast. This wisdom is a divine wisdom. It's a divine attribute. John is saying that it is only through divinely imparted wisdom 
will we be able to comprehend and discern the meaning of the satanic number 666 and the true character of the beast. John asks us to count the number, that is to figure it out, to give careful thought to the matter. We are not to jump to hasty conclusions as to the meaning of the number, nor are we to pick at anything for its meaning in a willy-nilly manner as we so often have to do. There have been many conjectures as to the meaning of 666. You see, numerical values are assigned to the alphabets of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And as a result, this has led to many interpretations of the number 666. Some believe that it stands for Emperor Nehru or Emperor Caligula. Some believe it stands for Muhammad, others Napoleon. Some believe it stands for Hitler. I was taught as a young Adventist Christian that it also referred to some inscription on the Pope's, the papal tiara, vicarious filii dei. I have seen on searching the internet that someone uses Sister Ellen White's name and it came up with the number 666. I, Leslie Alaric Thomas, can easily be referred to as the best interpretation of the number 666. Six letters in my first name, six letters in my second name, six letters in my last name, 666, there you have it. But none of these interpretations are convincing. In particular, Leslie Alaric Thomas. You see, if John wanted us to figure out the meaning of 666 by counting the numerical values of the letters, he would have certainly told us which language to use. Also, nowhere in the book of Revelation did John refer to an individual, past, present, or future, John always wrote extensively about religious and political systems. The application of, the, of 666 to particular individuals in history does not fit into the eschatological context of Revelation chapter 13 or the book of Revelation in its entirety. We are required to seek divine discernment to perceive the character of the beast so that we can protect ourselves from end-time delusions and deception. We are not required to perform mathematical calculations and mathematical gymnastics in trying to figure out the meaning of 666. John did not intend for us to do so. John said, it is a human number. A human number is a better translation of the number of a man. The context suggests that the number of the beast is somehow related to humanity. 666 is a human number. It has to do with human characteristics and human qualities that are distinctly different from divine characteristics and quality. The number six symbolizes a falling short of the divine ideal symbolized in the number seven. The beast falls short of the divine character that he's trying to come to feet. Theologian Philip E. Hughes states, the number six has understandably been regarded as a symbol of man, 
in that it falls short of the seven, which is the divine number. On this basis, the, three, the threefold sixes may be understood as indicative of a human or humanistic trinity, a counterfeit of the divine trinity, which, all, uh, which have the pretense to supreme power and authority that such a counterfeit implies. He continues, this pseudo-trinity, Satan, the dragon, the Antichrist, the first beast, the false prophet, the second beast, are united in one diabolical objective, namely to dethrone the creator and to enthrone the creature and to substitute the image of the beast for the image of God in man. The number 666 identifies the true character of the beast from the sea. This beast used its power, exalted himself against God, claiming worship for itself. This beast succeeds in deceiving those who dwell on the earth. And this deception is deadly. I do not know how many have died from COVID-19 because they believe or someone has persuaded them that the vaccine is the mark of the beast so they did not get themselves inoculated. Deception can be deadly. You may have your reasons for not taking the vaccine, but John did not say that the vaccine is the mark of the beast. We are all, we are called to be like the Bereans, search the scripture to see if those things which are taught us is true. John calls us to have wisdom and understanding. Don't be carried away by every wind of doctrine. It's about time that we think for ourselves. Consult with God through his word and through prayer. And stop being persuaded by those who do not have your interests at heart. How can you argue that a vaccine is the mark of the beast? If that means every vaccinated person would have received the mark of the beast and every unvaccinated person would have received the seal of God. There are only two groups in the end time. That means every drunk, every thief, every prostitute, every ashawo, every criminal, every anti-vaxxer, who is a criminal, would have received the fifth seal of God. It doesn't make sense. Let us all think for ourselves. I am not promoting the vaccine here. All I'm saying, that if you refuse to take the vaccine, it is on you, not on God. God did not say that 666, the mark of the beast, is the vaccine. The followers of Christ will be protected, though, in the end time from deceptions by having the seal of God, which contains the Christ's name and the name of his father. A person is sealed by the seal of the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can endow God's people with a spiritual discernment to perceive the deceptive nature of Satan's end time activity. Only the Holy Spirit can give us the ability to withstand those deceptions and remain loyal to God. Church, I urge you today to submit to the Holy Spirit that you may receive 
the seal of God and not the mark of the beast. May God bless you.